Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today on Deborah Cobelt Live. Fascinating author we have in studio with us today, Deb Spera. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And I love your book, Call Your Daughter Home. I can't put it down. I've, I've, I can't tell you how many people that I've called to say, pick it up. <laughs> and we're going to have a book club. And now that you told me that you, you attend the book clubs, yeah, I'd love to get you on board for that. I would so, love to do so. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to get into the book for just a moment. But this is your first. Mm -hmm. And leading up to that, you have led a life as a television executive. Yeah. Right? You yeah. own your own company, One Two Punch. Right. But before that, you uh, worked with Showtime, mm -hmm. where you shared your job because you were you and another woman, both moms. Mm -hmm. And I love this story. You shared your jobs as top executives over at Showtime. Yeah, we did. That's yeah, fantastic. It was it was a remarkable uh, thing that that was our boss's idea, and we both leapt into that. We both had two children at the time, same age. I didn't really know her very well, and she agreed to it, and we split the job. We both worked. Uh, Two days. She worked two days a week. I worked three days a week. We overlapped on a day, and we shot in that time that I was there of eight years, forty-two movies and miniseries. And wow, series, a lot. And she became one of my best friends. She that says a lot to me about the way they ran that company. Amazing. You know, I will tell you when I was at CNN and I was pregnant, um, the girl before me, they said to her, "Oh, just stay home and raise your kids." That didn't sit well by her. So by the time I got around, it was like, you're pregnant? No problem. How much time do you need off? So a lot's changed, yeah. you know? And I, then look at you. You were able to sh job share. And help. You know, it, it was good to be home some to raise my children, but I definitely needed a career. But I also didn't want to miss them as little. So important. Yeah. You know, and now it's so much more prevalent. So what are some of the films that you uh, got off the ground there? Oh, my goodness. Uh, the Baby Dance that Jodie Foster and Meg LaFove produced. Uh, Jane Anderson's first film she directed, and she wrote that. Uh, 10,000 Black Men Named George, Blind Justice. Uh, I did a remake of 12 Angry Men that William Friedkin directed, and I worked I twice with Jack Lemmon and George C. Scott Ooh. and Armin Mueller Stahl. And, I mean, it was James Gandolfini. It was one of the first things he oh. did. Uh, yeah. Love and miss him. Lo I, I did so many things. It was it was a really special time in my life. You were born in Kentucky. I was. Your parents were 16 and 19. That's really young. Very young. They were like your siblings, essentially. <laughs> yeah. The doctor handed me to my mother and said, okay, you guys are going to grow up together. And we wow. did. Yeah. Wow. What was it like growing up in Kentucky with such young parents? Um, the the positive were was that my parents were both very liberal and very uh, big believers in uh, equality for everyone and took us to peace rallies. And, you know, they were very staunch about that. Um, the tough part was they were really young and they were very they were thrust into roles that neither of them were prepared for and um, n neither of them were really happy about. So that was the hard part. Oh, I can't imagine. A yeah. lot of people end up with kids much older than that, and they're they're not even prepared. But yeah. imagine being a kid yourself. Yeah. My grandmother wow. had a huge hand in helping raise me, whom I call Mamaw. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this book that you wrote, which we'll get into in a bit, yeah. um, was very much inspired by your grandmother mm -hmm. and your great-grandmother. Yep. And you almost ended up with five generations because everyone was so young, but it was <laughs> your great-grandmother who passed just before your daughter was born, you Correct. Say. Yeah. That's amazing yeah. because in my family, there are so <laughs> many years between all of us. Um, my mother had me late in her 40s, which was wow. impossible. Right? By the time I, I mean, that was just not her. You were a surprise. I think I was. So <laughs> they sure say, I, I'm not sure. She she remembers very clearly the, the night of conception. I'm like, okay, thank you. But um, And she said she went to the, to the doctor and said, I think I have a stomach tumor. And he goes, that tumor's breathing. So um, yeah, and then in between her and her mom were many, many years. So it was like three generations over like 100 years. It's yeah. crazy. And you've got five generations with like 16 years apart. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, so growing up in Kentucky, you wanted to get out of there, sort of. Not because of Kentucky, but you, you had a creative way about you wanted to Well, go. I really, as a child, I read incessantly. Mm. I, I, and in some ways, perhaps it was my escape from mm -hmm. growing up in a little bit of turmoil. But I, I knew the world was bigger, yeah. and I wanted to experience a bigger part of the world. And I felt like I belonged in the world. And, um, and I... At Kentucky wasn't giving me that. There was a real lack of diversity where I grew up. And um, there was a lot of turmoil where I grew up, civil rights turmoil. Uh, 1977, when busing was passed, the people in my community rioted. 
and they wanted the, nothing. The KKK with it. marched down the street every night, uh, the summer of 1977. So I witnessed all that, and I didn't want to be a part of all that. And I wanted to, I wanted to get out. I wanted to be a part of the world. What did your parents say? They encouraged Go. it. Yeah. Go. Yeah. They so were, where you went to New York? I went to New York, scared to death. Never seen it. Never been there before. Only saw it in pictures and in How'd movies. How'd you get there? Did you like get on a bus and go like had, everybody else? I had six hundred dollars, and I no, I got on an airplane one way, and I left. I had these. Remember, I don't know if you remember jelly sandals, these plastic sandals. Oh, they were cool. Yeah, it was summertime, and I and I wore those, and I remember walking around the city, and they just ate my feet. You know, I didn't, and I and I was so. It was such culture shock for me because New York was so such a diverse place, and I so had not grown up though, in right? any. Oh, it was amazing! It what was a, amazing! Wow, the I'm food sure. Food and the people and the and the in the chaos, which you know, as a girl from Kentucky, chaos was a little bit frightening, but I learned a lot. It's that. such a beautiful place. I mean, I'm from back east, and I love New York. It'll always be my favorite city, mm-hmm. no matter where I travel. I love it. It's very diverse, and there's always something going on. You're right about the food, oh. about the theater, which I know that you did theater when you were in New York. I Tell did. me about that. Well, I uh, that's what, you know, when I was growing up, the only thing I could think to do that was in the entertainment industry, because I, knew, I didn't know about the other jobs, right. was be an actor. So I studied theater in college, and then after college, I went to the Actors Theater of Louisville, where I was an acting apprentice and where I met my husband. And you worked with Bill Esper. I, I studied with Bill Esper when I moved to New York for two years, and, and he was a remarkable teacher. Phenomenal, because uh, I told you I knew him from Rutgers University. Oh, yeah. And I have friends who studied under him. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he he he's a was a remarkable yeah. man and teacher. Mm-hmm. He is uh, he dedicated. Has a legacy. Yeah, very much so. And uh, and I did theater in L.A. I mean, in New York rather. And then when I moved to L.A., I I moved here as an actor, and I got tired of being told I was too tall, too short, too fat, too thin, too pretty, not pretty enough. To everything. Yeah. <laughs> and it's I, like, what do you want me to do? Really? Just just let me know. I <laughs> I could never understand that. Yeah, yeah, and I needed more control in my life, so I started producing theater, and I thought, oh, I really like this. It, here it, in L.A. Like, yeah, mm. I utilized my heart and my head, and I had some success producing theater, and um, I fell in love with it, and. Uh, one evening, a friend and my husband took me out to dinner and said, you're much happier producing. And I thought, yeah, I, I am. And But if I produce theater, I'm going to be poor my whole life. And I didn't want to be poor. So I got into film and television. And what was your first job? And Wasn't it at Regency? It was at Regency. I was an assistant to the president. His name was Steve Ruther. Uh, we did eight to ten movies a year. We had a huge job. Uh, Arnon Milshon still owns the company to this day. Right, and that was at the time what Free Free Willy, Pretty we did Women, Pretty Woman, Free Willy, Guilty by Suspicion, JFK, uh, Under Siege. What um, did you do when you were when you were employed by them? I, I was an assistant to the president. I learned a lot from him. I worked twelve to fourteen hours a day because he worked nonstop, um, and I was you know loving it in the room when notes were given. I learned a lot about the process. I learned a lot about filmmaking. That's when we were making films with film and not with video um it was just a remarkable two years of my life and then I got pregnant and uh had my daughter did you stay home or did you go right back to work no I went back to work after three months and then I I uh, took a job at actually I left the business altogether and became a grief counselor for a while that's interesting how'd you get into that now that I didn't know (laughs) Yeah. How'd you get I, into that? I, you know, I had I suffered a loss in my life in 1990. My brother's wife and son were killed in a car accident, and it really blindsided everybody in my family. And the, my nephew was seven at the time. And so I was just heartbroken. And I went to a grief recovery uh, seminar, and they really helped glue my butt back on. And so after I um, worked with Steve, wow. I got a call from them saying, look, we just started the first hospital program in the country for grievers, and we need someone to come over here and manage it. Would you be willing? And I I wanted to get away from the entertainment industry. I wanted to have a little bit more of a simpler life. And that was probably one of the most rewarding jobs of my entire life. Uh, I got to work with a lot of really fascinating people and work with grievers. Wow, incredible. Yeah. And then you went on to work with... Um you went to what Mark Gordon Productions. I went to Showtime next. Showtime, um, right? Yeah. We oh, actually, talking. I went to Eden Rock next. I was still in film, and we did What's Eating Gilbert Grape and George Clooney's first film from Dusk Till Dawn. What's um, Eating Gilbert Grape to this day remains one of my favorite me films. Too. Another one he happens to be in Leonardo DiCaprio, um, Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, but that's that's later on in his career. Yeah. But What's Eating Gilbert Grape? I was 
absolutely convinced that this was a person who had, um, you know, some disabilities, for yeah. lack of a better word. I was stunned when I first, you know, saw the actor. That boy, what an what an incredible actor! Such a beautiful Oof. script too. That Peter Hedges wrote that based on a book that he wrote, and and to this day, it's one also one of my favorite films. Also, beautiful film. Yeah. So you, I mean, you started. You were working with a lot of the greats in the business. Wow. I mean, they didn't know me, but I was. No, no. but you watched them. <laughs> yes. And it was all coming. I was inside, learning. Yeah. You were exactly. really learning. And and so, yeah. so after that, I went to Showtime Networks, and I was there for eight years, and uh, and we did a lot of a lot of material. Yeah, where you that's where you shared your job with yep. another woman, right? Katie and Coyle. then um, you became president of the, uh, Mark Gordon. Yeah, the Mark Gordon production. Television Company. Mark called me after I left Showtime and said that. Mark's a very prolific uh, film producer, and he said that he was uh, going to sign a television deal, and he needed someone to come over and run that part of his company. And so I went, and he had. They had just wrapped um, Grey's Anatomy, and uh, it hadn't even been aired yet. They just finished the pilot. And he, I came in the end of July, and he said, I'd like to sell four shows. I'd never done television series before, only movies and miniseries and one reality series. But other than that, I hadn't done anything like that. But we sold four shows in the first year. One of them was Criminal Minds, and Grey's Anatomy hit, and then Criminal Minds hit, and we were off to the track. I mean, we were. Now, when you do this, you have to read a lot of scripts. Mm-hmm. You have to read and Incessantly, read, and yeah. then you have to option, and you have to call people, and then stuff doesn't get made. It does get made. But all of this was going on in your mind, right? And then one day, years later, you thought, I'm going to write something of my own, yeah. right? How did Call Your Daughter Home come to pass. Now I know that you, you obviously had ideas in your mind. You said you actually took an extension course. Yeah. I, at UCLA. Yes. I wanted to write I wanted to write something of my own. I've been a midwife to other writers for so long. Yeah. You know, I really helped them bring their vision to fruition. And I was I hit a lull in my career at, at that point and I didn't have anything on the horizon. So I thought I'm I'm just gonna write a little something of my own just to check it off the bucket list. And I had an idea about a small novella, a tiny novella, which was consisted of five short stories about five women from the same Southern family, five different generations of women. And each short story took place in a different time. So you would track the trajectory of these women from um, from dependency uh, and desperation to autonomy and, and freedom. And that's what I wanted to track, how, how one family came through that. I loved the characters Gertrude, mm-hmm. Retta, and Annie, why don't you tell us when this starts to take place back in 1924, just before the Great Depression in right. this country, but yet the South was going through its own depression yes, because of the boll weevil infestation. Right. The I mean, cotton crop was pretty much destroyed. People were starving. Mm-hmm. And you've got these three women, strong women, mm-hmm. mothers, mm-hmm. who came together. Yeah. Gertrude is the mother of four daughters. Uh, Mm. She married at 13, an arranged marriage. And um, she has to make an unconscionable decision to save her daughters from starving or to die at the hands of an abusive husband. And she makes a very unconscionable decision. And uh, and Retta is a first generation free woman. Uh, Her family were they were owned by the family that she still works for. She's married to the love of her life, Odell, and they started a, a small community in Branchville called Shake Rag. That's an all-black community that still exists. You that's could, incredible. It still exists. Oh, yeah. Mm. You ask anybody. It's not on a map, but we're Shake Rag, and they'll point they'll you in point. the direction. And then Annie is the matriarch of the plantation where Retta works, and she was wealthy herself before she entered into a marriage that her husband, who's a very powerful man in the region, it was also very wealthy. But she has a side business because years prior she lost her 12-year-old son in um, in a – he k- killed himself. And she <sighs> threw herself into her own business, and she owns the sewing circle that employs all the regional women sewing feed and seed bags. And based on her son Lonnie's uh, desire to branch out, she they're moving into a men's line. And it's really the story of these three women and – all three have suffered terrible losses, and all three must come together to fight a greater evil. And I wanted to explore what happens when three different women from different class and ethnicity come together and how they could be a dangerous force for good. Oh, I love that. <laughs> what is the greater evil? Can you can you just give us a little something for people who have not read it that they get together to, to, to combat? Um Annie is probably the most blind of the characters, even though she's the most wealthy. And she stumbles upon um, a revelation that mm. changes 
the way she Ooh, views I her life. I want to give it away, but we can't. Can't give it away. You can't do it. <laughs> oh. And that, what she thought was, was her life up to this point, she realizes was a lie. Yeah. And based on that lie, she decides to take matters into her own hands. And Retta and Annie, Retta and Gertrude come alongside her, and they together they change the trajectory of that entire town, really. Yes, they do. I love how each chapter is named after the character. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like chapter three, you know, Gertrude goes to the store. It's about the character. Chapter one, Gertrude. Right. Chapter two, it's about the women in this story. Yes. I'll tell you, the minute you open the book and you're at, I'll call it chapter one, which is Gertrude. Oh, I love this. It's easier to kill a man than a gator, but it takes the same kind of weight you got to watch for the weakness and take your shot to the back of the head. Oh, when I read that, I'm like, <laughs> who's going down? I got to know right now. And then right right there, you grab us. And then I've, I've since read some reviews and everyone, that line right there, where did where did this come from? I wish I knew. That line just wow. came to me. I, I this, this short story is the first in the collection that I wrote, mm -hmm. but it was the last one that I wrote. I struggled with it. It was. I was scared of it. I didn't know quite how to how to tackle it. Wow. And so I just, I literally wrote down in two days this story. And um, this particular chapter. Yes, this, this yeah. particular chapter. And this is the, this first chapter is the first short story of that small novella that I wrote. Well, it got us all going. I mean, I know that. Uh, Oprah's Magazine loved it. You've got NPR.com. Mm -hmm. You've got kudos from so many brilliant writers who've read this. And you really captured a lot of people. How did you do your research on this? Because I, I realized that you, as a kid, right, you went back and forth there. Didn't you spend yeah, time? Yeah, I spent a lot of time there. We would go visit my great-grandmother, whom I call Mama Lane. And she lived in this little clapboard house on Freedom Highway. It had no indoor plumbing. It oh, i got to just say, your southern accent's starting to come out. <laughs> You're talking about it, and you go, and she lived in this little thing. But, Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we'll and, go there. And there was no indoor plumbing, so there was a, a bright red pump by the back kitchen door, and that's where you we would you know use the water for our necessities: washing dishes, washing clothes, washing our bodies. Uh, she Did you enjoy it? I was fascinated. Yeah, by you must have been fascinated. I was fascinated, as a little fascinated kid. by her. There were all these pecan trees in the backyard, and we we'd crack open the pecans and shell them and store them for winter and everything went to use. An old dress was made into an apron. You know, she was just a really quiet strong determined woman yeah. filled with fortitude who raised four daughters and a son on her own mm. so i was just mesmerized by the place and by her and by the way of life and it I, it never left me so clearly I, yeah did you ever want to spend time there as an adult i have <laughs> in oh. fact i did a lot of research i went back i have family that is still back there and um i i reconnected with family and they took me through the stomping grounds of Branchville, South Carolina, and introduced me to people that were hugely helpful and informative in the writing of this book. Um, Reverend Vernon Blanchard at Canaan Baptist Church. He's a rem literally the most remarkable preacher I've ever met in my life. If, if you've never been to an all-black ba Southern Baptist church... Oh, please go. Highly recommend. I don't care where you are, what town, go to one. And just the call and response and the call and response. And, and that's sort of how I... I tackled the rhythms in this book hmm. because it's he helped me so much with sermons and with with the word and and um and and then camp the is a revival place in right. in, in this book in where the climax takes place in St. George it still exists 250 years old it's 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 one, 99 what they call tents but they're really two story cabins in a circle and in the middle is a tabernacle and it's a remarkable place uh so I was just interested in the the place and and people gave me something every time I asked. You know, you lived in New York. You live in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, when you go there and you're doing your research, do you feel like it's so different than the way you live? Because it is still different there. It's very Things different. Things have changed, but it's different. It's very different, but it feels like home to me. Like right. I feel like these are my people. <laughs> like like these are the people that understand the way I talk, the way I think. Um, the food, you know, my stomach never hurts when I'm in the South. <laughs> it wow. hurts all the time when I'm here. And I don't know if it's Not just mine. The, the city or <laughs> what, but I, 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 we have a life here. We we have three children here. I've built a life here. I've built a career here. But every time I go back to South Carolina or Kentucky, as soon as my the plane descends, I just feel like, oh. I'm home, I'm home. Wow. But isn't that the way? I think wherever you felt most comfortable as a child, yeah. 
you know, and hopefully you felt comfortable there as a child. When yeah. you go back, you're home. Yeah. And you may move and, and spend the rest of your life somewhere else, but that's always a part of, yeah. of you, which is why you wrote this book. Yeah. I found it interesting that you were going to call it, what, The Alligator? I was going to call it Alligator. It was titled Alligator, and the publishers of so Park So much wrote, better. Well, the publishers of Park Row said you, you have to change the name because if anybody Googles Alligator, they're going to Google Florida or children's books. No, there's and no doubt about it. So I, I balked at first. I was like, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. At one point, I called my agent and said, tell them we'll give them the money back. I can't do it. And she said, you, we're not giving that money back. You're, you can do this. And then I remembered that whenever I read a book that I love, I always believe that the theme is in the heart of the book, the center of the book. So you opened it up. I opened to the center of the book. You cranked it open. You know, I actually tried doing that while, when I was reading this because I know your whole story. And I'm like, where was that? Yeah. So I did. I was looking for yeah. that moment where you found. And you, I opened it to the center of the book, and it's Retta in a birth scene with a young woman <gasps> who helps her. And she's telling the young woman Go get who's your giving daughter. birth. Go get my daughter. You know, you're, she believed your child is at the gate. Your child is waiting. Your child, call your daughter home. Call her home. Wow. And so I was like, oh, that's it. It resonates on every in every way. It really, in, in every way. Yeah. In every way. Yeah. How has this changed, this book changed the community there? Oh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. They're, I know that they're happy, you know, that I wrote it. And um, the woman who was my inspiration for Retta, I got to meet her finally. We had a lot of conversations on the phone. She's married to Glenn, oh, Retta and Glenn Miller. They're, they live in Branchville, South Carolina. And Glenn was the first black mayor of Branchville. And they, they were just, she was very close friends with my great aunt Louise. I modeled the friendship between Retta and um, Mrs. Walker, based on their friendship, but very beautiful friendship they had. Yeah, oh, I, they're I, so. This is such a rich story. So yeah. We've had a lot of conversations, so I finally got to meet her this past summer when I went back, and I know how pleased they are, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy they feel honored because I want to. I wanted to honor them. I feel that in this book, like I actually feel it when I'm reading through the pages, how th there's a real message in here. How you want to honor the women that came up before yeah. all of us. And I was daunted to write a woman of color. I'm a white woman from the South. How dare I write a woman of color? I was I was scared of that um, because I didn't. I didn't, wasn't sure if I had the right to do that. But the more I talked to Miss Retta in Branchville, the more I thought, well, I want to. I want to honor her. her. I want to honor the, these friendships. I want to honor her place in this community. Uh, so I thought. How, I be how beautiful, though, that you were welcomed like that. Because oh. you could have walked into this community. they like, what does she know? You know, but you weren't. And I think it's probably because of the way you walked into this community. They knew my family. They knew your family. They knew my great-grandmother. They knew my, my, my grandmother and her sisters. They, I mean, every person in Branchville know some member of my family do you have a favorite excerpt that you'd like to read do you ever do that um, when you're uh, when putting do. you on the spot i i do um i can read a little bit of gertrude uh you read the first couple lines but i, I mean do you have Here. something you want me to read or? no i, I just okay. picked you know some parts that i loved myself that resonated with me because you know what i found it doesn't matter what paragraph i could just open right here very descriptive writing. You you bring me in immediately. It's 12.30 p.m. when Jackie, our mailman, arrives to take what I've readied. They were ahead of schedule before the illness spread. Just two simple sentences set a stage for what was about to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And no matter where I go in this book, it's so well written. Oh, thank you. I yeah, appreciate if you, that. If you have something you'd like to I, read, I, I'll, I'll read this. I, I, I'll read this short passage. Um, Gertrude, uh, it's easier to kill a man than a gator, but it takes oh. the same kind of weight. You got to watch for the weakness and take your shot to the back of the head. This gator I'm watching is watching me too. She smells the last of my menstrual blood, so she's half in, half out of the water, mm -hmm. laid up on the ridge of dry land that is our footpath through the swamp and out to the main road. I'm propped against an old cypress. We're a pair. I'm sick with pain. The hours of wait have made me stiff, but it don't matter. None of that matters. All that counts is this ridge laid out like a rope between us. This big old thing's got her back to the nest my girl Alma spotted earlier today. She's a ten-foot mama, big enough to feed us through fall. Got two shells in this gun, but only one chance for a kill. When we've come to Reevesville, I was hoping to get Alvin straight, but it looks like he's going to run me crazy. Ever since the bull weevil took our crop, he ain't done nothing but drink for nigh on a year. We left everything we had in Branchville, including two of our four daughters, and come over here to the, his daddy's sawmill for work. I hope steady work and some food in our bellies would might set him right, but he ain't right. Maybe he never will be. 
First, he closed the mill at one o'clock yesterday and didn't come home till late last night. Then he found the letter my brother from my brother Burns telling me of a job over in Branchville. He hates Burns for taking care of what he can't. He wailed on me and warned me to stay put. He's still mad from the last time I went to see my brother for help. Now my eyes swole shut. I can't see out of it. And the only letter I've had for a month giving me the news about my two oldest children is burned and gone. Alvin laid in the bed all morning until his daddy come over here and raised hell. Now he's gone off to work, sick with drink, and we're left with nothing but the sound of our own bellies. I've about worked myself to death here, and it ain't done any good. I'm the woman of a house that don't exist. So that's Gertrude. Girl, where do those words come from? How did you learn to write like this from where you come from? Clearly, it's all in your head. I know you took an extension course, which, <laughs> which kind of killed me. It's like, but uh, clearly they saw something in you because they helped push, helped you push this along, didn't well, they? I, I wow. Mean, I had a... I, How did you get a student like you coming through the door? I could hear their voices in my head. It was yeah. crazy. I could just hear them talking to me. And I really wanted this to be a book that, while it explores dire circumstances, it... Ex- Look, I'm going to tell the truth. I wrote this book to try and understanding the deep anxiety that runs through my family. The women in my family have a deep anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I could write into it, I could understand it. And what I discovered was that we're not victims of our circumstance. That we're built to rise above our circumstances. Regardless of our fears, we walk forward in spite of them or despite them, you know. And that's what the women in my family did. And and when I was so afraid to write this book, I just said to myself, you can fail. It's okay. Just write one hour every day. Write as badly as you can. It's okay. You can, I'm give you, I give myself permission to fail. And by giving yourself permission to fail, things started to become alive to me in ways that I'd never imagined. And I started to hear these voices, and I started to try and run to capture them. Boy, if that's not beautifully said. And it's true. Yeah. I've heard that before from writers, from great musicians. You hear it in your head. Yeah. You have to get it out. Were you doing this while you were running One Two Punch, your yes, company? Yes. So by day, you're this major executive. Yeah. Huh. I would work all morning and then about two o'clock in the afternoon, I would sit down and write from two to four. Two to three initially. Cause it's a discipline. You got to do it, right? You I, can't just say, oh, I want to do this book like... No, you got to sit down, right? Yeah, I wanted to, and I and I had this remarkable opportunity. An agent said, "I read your work. I love your work. These aren't short stories. These are novels in disguise. Start with the first one. I want to represent you. Go." And wow. I was like, "Oh, what?" And I cried for two weeks on the couch, like somebody shot my mother, because I was scared. I thought, "I can't write a book. I've never written a book." But oh, I yes, had can. this opportunity, and I didn't want to miss it. So I just said, every day at 2 o'clock. And then the body starts to respond. Okay, you're sitting down to write. Okay, this is your time. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Did you ever go over? Because I've All talked the time. To, yeah, I've talked to many <clears throat> writers, and you do designate your time. It's really the only way you could do it. But I, I, one friend of mine said, I don't go over. I save it till the next day because she wanted to stay motivated. You know, everybody has their way yeah. of getting out the characters and getting getting into the head of these characters. So how I, long did it even take you to do this book? Uh, the first draft took me five and a half months. The second draft took me ten and a half. I mean, total ten and a half months. And then we sold it uh, under the, uh, in under a year. She sold it with like five wow. publishing houses bidding on it. It was, it was an exciting time. So you have a, another book behind this, don't you? That's my hope. I'm just giving myself permission to write badly every day for one hour. But I got to get my daughter. Are you writing badly I'm, right now? I'm, I'm, my daughter's getting married <laughs> in in October, so I. Oh, really? That's I'm all. Just trying to, and I just got one off to college, so I'm trying to. And I have a kitchen being remodeled, so yes, I'm writing badly. Oh, that's the one that'll set you back. It's the kitchen. I, I, but it's st- It's in fits and starts, so we'll. See. Are those characters speaking to you too? Yes. N- the trajectory of this book became clear pretty quickly. The trajectory of the one I'm working on now isn't as clear. So um, it's fits and starts. Does it follow these people and, and generations afterwards yes. of these people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, so the second sort of one like is yeah. post-World War II, 1949-50. It's um, Gertrude's youngest daughter, Mary, who's dying in the beginning of the book mm-hmm. from yeah. starvation. Uh, it's her as an adult woman uh, and her story. And she migrates to Kentucky. So I'm oh wow! So you trajectory. brought her. To, hmm, is this a little <laughs> bit of Deb in this story? So she's going to Kentucky uh, now. Yeah, she's going to Kentucky. Wow! Yeah, and Highland Park is a is a was a neighborhood right next to the L and N railroad yard, and that neighborhood consisted of blue collar workers who would work predominantly for the railroad. It doesn't exist anymore. The city tore it down to make way for the an expansion for the airport, mm. which 
they never expanded. Uh, and many people lost their homes. But that neighborhood was filled with people from somewhere else and all blue collar. So I'm interested in people who have been displaced, who go someplace for opportunity and end up making that their home. Very interesting. Do you, um, wow, do you ever, you know, get, if you will, pigeonholed? Someone will just look at you and go, what do you know? And there's just so much good. That happened to me once. I gave a lecture to these young people on mm-hmm. reporting. I said, go ahead and size me up. And boy, did they have it just all wrong yeah, in terms yeah. of the way I grew up and how I grew up and my background, all wrong. Oh, yeah. And the first thing I said was, please, park your whatever prejudices you have, leave them at the door because you really never know it's someone. So I suspect this happened to you so much <laughs> as you as you go through this journey with these books. They're looking at this cute you know, blonde lady walking in the door and it's like, you have no idea, you know, why I'm writing this and why I have to write it about all of you. I feel that way about my whole career. I I'll bet. feel like, you know, I've been a, a little bit out of out of um, place my whole career because of the way I look or the way I sound. Uh, it's easy to write off someone who looks like me or something. like And it's important like not to. And leave that at the door. Yeah. Those prejudices. Everyone. Yeah. Leave the prejudices at the door. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. I so enjoy talking to you. What else can you tell this, uh, us about the book to tease it a little bit for people who, because I I can't say enough about this. I told you I've, I've told lots of friends. I'm getting my word out there. I think of it as a southern gothic adventure. It is uh, an You adventure. know, they talk about it as historical fiction and I'll, I'm happy with whatever sells the books and I'm happy for people to read the book but for me it's an adventure and it is uh it can be dark but at the end there's this optimism there's this strength there's this fortitude there's this ability to overcome in all of these women uh and so in all of us in every woman i know and i grew up with some strong women yeah Yeah. and we have to always i was talking to my previous guest we can't never give that up Mm -mm. and there's always been this fight this tug with women and i i presume there always will be when will the day come where there's just equality across the board i was i was talking earlier how melinda gates mm-hmm. just recently said it'll take about 250 years now she, <laughs> no, but she had right. a re- she had a reason for that and i'm thinking oh, it's not that bad considering how long it's we've been around with there's been no equality you know, I, but I, she based that on economic reasons and oh. cultural reasons and all kinds of things and i thought hmm, i actually want to look more into that if i, I grew up in the 70s and you know when my parents got divorced there was this wave of feminism that came through. Mm-hmm. Every, women were burning their bras. Everybody on the street got divorced. You know, I thought, whoa, look at this. Women wanted equal opportunity, equal rights. And I thought, okay, that's it. Now we've, now we've got it. Yeah, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> no. And when you when you go and research a book like this, you realize definitely not. Yeah, no. <laughs> but we have so much in common with these characters. I know I saw myself in each one of them. And Good. I'm sure anyone who reads this book. And by the way, this is a book for men and women. It's a historical perspective, which is what I love about it. You're deep into the history mm-hmm. of the area. Your research is, is spot on. Yeah, thank you. You do it all yourself? That's what yeah, I Yeah, I did it all by myself, yes. You don't have somebody all. saying, oh, by the way. No. Uh-uh. It's the best I just follow my in. interest. Yeah. I just mm-hmm. follow my nose. And I really am happy with... Um, with a, a lot of the people on the back of the book that, that give kudos yes. to the book are men, are are male. I m- noticed that men uh, authors whom I whom I love and respect. Rob, yep, yeah, Robert Butler. Uh, um, yeah, Mark Bowden. Uh, you know, uh, John Johnny Jonathan Miles. These are writers who, uh, and I have so many women writers I love and adore and respect. But I didn't want this just to be a book for women. Mm-hmm. It's a book for everyone because it's about humanity and that there is no gender in that. So mm-hmm. I wanted I wanted men and women. Remember that it is book. about humanity. By the way, I even sectioned that off because I noticed their comments and I noticed that they were men and they actually got the book spot on. It's um, it's a fantastic read. Please, Thank everyone, you. I implore you, male, female, whatever. But you'll find yourself in this book. And I really mean that. Thank you. And I, I felt it, and I am. Um, I thank you for writing it. Yes. Well, thank you for and, having me today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add before I let you go? Um. Just please buy the book and read it, and I hope you like it. And I'm available for book clubs. Oh, and I'm going to be at the last bookstore in downtown L.A. on September 30th with E.R. Ramsapur, who wrote this beautiful book, The Ventriloquists. And she she and I are going to be in conversation. So I'll be talking about my book. She'll be talking about her book. Well, tell me when that is again. September 30th at 730 at the last bookstore 
in downtown LA. I want to do that. Also, there's a bookstore near where I live, and sometimes we do talks there. I'm going to see if maybe you want to go. Wouldn't Great. that be fun? Yeah. And I, I, I enjoy doing that very much. We bring in the authors. Yeah. And it'd be, you know, and then I interview the authors. I love doing that. Cool. It's just yeah, really a lot absolutely. of fun. Absolutely. I'm available. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that as well. Well, thanks so much. Yes, thank you. And by the way, shout out to my friend John Kelly because yep. he introduced us. Thank you so much. And John also gave me my first baby dog, a bulldog named Molly. He did. <laughs> as a wedding gift. Oh, what a sweet so man. He's always been a nice guy, that John Kelly. <laughs> yes, John, yes. thank you so much. So right. I appreciate it. And uh, please, everybody, call your daughter home. It's great. And if the opening like paragraph doesn't get you about the gator, I don't know what will. <laughs> so uh, thank you for tuning in to Deborah Cobelt Live. I do want to mention today is 9 11. We spoke mm-hmm. about that earlier. And um, if you could just take a moment, just one moment, and think about. Um, how that's changed our country from that moment on, and actually our world. Mm -hmm. So I just want to give um, my thoughts out to all the people who have been affected and are still affected from that horrible, um, that horrible, horrible day. Uh, Thank you so much for tuning in. We are on Apple Podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio. We're kind of everywhere. Uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, I don't know where else. Um, YouTube, big following on YouTube. Um, Wherever you get your podcasts, your audio ones, your video ones, you'll find us, Deborah Cobelt Live. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Bye.